Nom Nom delivers fresh food with whole ingredients, backed by veterinarian science. Science tells us that a dog's health starts in the bowl, so improving their diet is one of the best ways to help them live a long and happy life. Nom Nom's food is full of proteins your dog loves and the vitamins and nutrients they need to thrive. All you have to do is order, pour, and serve. Ready to make the switch to fresh? Order Nom Nom today. Go to https colon slash slash trinom.com forward slash curveball and get 50% off your first order plus free shipping. That's https colon slash slash t-r-y-n-o-m dot com forward slash curveball. Plus, Nom Nom comes with a money back guarantee. If your dog's tail isn't wagging within 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your first order. No fillers, no nonsense, just Nom Nom. Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by retired academic Gail Piner. Gail has retired and she is now pursuing a career as an author, a career that she has always wanted to do since the age of 12. She wrote a book about the life of her grandmother, Mary, and we're going to be talking to her about that and everything that she's up to. So, Gail, thank you so much for joining me today. Curtis, thank you for having me here. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Sure. As you said, I am a retired academic. I used to be a college professor for over 25 years. And so I'm used to writing research papers and, of course, teaching college students and MBA students. My background was in psychology and management. And uh, anyway, I had thought as a kid that I would grow up to be a writer. And in a way, I did. But writing research papers, very different from writing novels, especially a novel based on a true story, which is the my first novel that was just published this June. And so I guess I am finally you know, living the dream. And I am now a published author, long, long last, at least published fiction writer. So hooray. Absolutely. Congratulations on that. And you said you wanted to be an author since the age of 12. So. Oh, at least. I was always a, a bookworm. And I think I just assumed that as much as I loved reading, that one day I'd be writing books as well. So somewhere I remember in junior high school, as we used to call it, I guess it's middle school now, my girlfriends and I would write little stories and just had a a very good time, you know, with no critical voice going on or anything like that. And those were the days. But of course, as you get older, especially as you go to grad school, you get lots of critical voices in and outside of your your head. But uh, it's it's been quite an adventure kind of finding my way back to what I originally intended to do. It wasn't a straight path for sure. Well, you decided to write a book about y- your grandmother. So tell yes. us about your grandmother and why you decided to write a book about her. This is a story that I grew up with. And one of the things I would like to get across with this book is that every family has wonderful stories. And unfortunately, those stories are all too quickly forgotten in because they're taken for granted. Or sometimes people are reticent to discuss it. They think maybe their children or grandchildren wouldn't be interested. And sometimes, of course, that is the case, sadly. But I grew up knowing that my mother had had an unusual childhood. I'm trying not to give away the ending of the book. At the beginning of the book, which is, the again, the story I grew up with, my grandmother was just a couple of weeks short of her 30th birthday when my grandfather died. He was 
only 10 years older than she was, and it was a sudden death. She was left with a sixth grade education in 1928 uh, in the South, and she had six living children. She'd had one who had died in infancy. So she has six children to support from the ages of 12 and a half to down to four months old. And as you might imagine, she was completely unprepared to be in that position. Her husband, my grandfather, was a manager for landowners. So he managed six or seven farms and probably had, I'm sure they had a small family farm for their own produce and so forth and a few, some animals. But I'm sure that when she married, and she married quite young, unusually young for her family. She was only 14 when she got married, whereas her sisters, her mother were all late teens or well into their 20s when they got married. So there's a story there, a mystery that I never really found out why she married so soon. And uh, But she did. And I'm sure her family thought she was lucky in that her husband had such a good job. I think financially of the four sisters and herself, she was probably in the best position financially while he was alive. But of course, when he died, everything changed. The house that they lived in went with his job, which meant she was instantly homeless, had to get out to make room for the next manager who would come in with his family. So very quickly, um, we find that at the start of my book, that she, this is where she is. It's the day of her husband's funeral. And the book covers 15 months. So it goes from October of 1928 to New Year's Eve, just before the beginning of 1930. And most of us know that we're talking the Great Depression is right there. So she had 15 months to decide how to support herself, how to take care of her children. And it's the, the kind of thing where I knew the bare bones. I knew what she decided to do. I knew the beginning, I knew the end, I knew a very tiny bit, I knew that she had stayed with her children, with her parents on their farm for a while, and that she had ultimately made the decision that she makes at the end of the book. But I didn't know how to get, you know, how she got from point A to point B, because growing up with this story, I took it for granted, and I didn't ask many questions. Fortunately, I did have a few conversations with her. And of course, my mother talked a little bit about it, but she was very young during the period of the book that I cover. But I had to imagine what must have happened for my grandmother to make the decision that she ultimately makes. She has two basic paths that are open to her. You would think that with a fairly large family, she had four sisters who had their own families. Uh, her parents were living, you might think, well, they could just move in with one of them. But it wasn't just Mary, my grandmother, it was Mary plus six children. And each one of her sisters had multiple uh, children of their own. And every year or so, of course, another baby would come along. They really didn't have room for a family of seven to move in with them. Her parents were getting older and in fact, my grandfather died a few years later. So that wasn't really a viable option. She had to figure out what to do. So when I, as I wrote the book, it was very much like being a detective of uh, trying to think, why, why would this have happened? What would have made her go that direction? And one key element that I knew that she had discussed with me was that as I started to say, she had two basic choices then open to her. She could take up an offer that came from her husband's brothers. In the book, I call them Elam and Odom, Otis, Elam and Otis. In reality, there were actually four brothers. They all had tobacco farms here in southeastern North Carolina, and they wanted the children. And she told me that she was very, very sure that they wanted the children to work in the fields and that if she let the children go with the uncles, that those children would never be sent to school. And they would essentially be free laborers for their relatives. And they would be second-class citizens because all of those men had their own families. So none of those children, there were four girls and two boys, 
none of them were going to inherit land or anything from their uncles in preference over you know, the uncle's own children, that wasn't going to happen. The other option open to her was an orphanage. And that was because my grandfather had belonged to a civic organization, actually a national civic organization. And one of the good works that they did was they helped build an orphanage in Lexington, North Carolina, that is actually still in operation. And curiously, they built it for their own children. It was not an orphanage open to any orphan. It was only for the children of the members of the civic org organization, the American Mechanics Junior Order. And that was another mystery because I have been unable, including talking to the orphanage itself, they don't know why it started out that way. It didn't stay that way. It eventually became essentially a public orphanage, and now it handles foster children. But um, again, acting as a detective, the only thing I could really come up with was that this was 1928. It, the orphanage had opened in 1926. So what happened that would have led a group of men to raise money for a very nice orphanage? The architecture is based on the University of Virginia. So it's a pretty campus. Not, you know, luxurious or anything, but it was nice. It wasn't a Charles Dickens type of orphanage. But what would have led them to do this for their own children? And I thought of two things. One was World War I. Men get killed in, in war. And especially at that time, it was the men were soldiers. And they may have seen what happened to women who were left having to support a family or trying to support a family. And the other thing that happened, of course, at the end of World War I was the Spanish flu, which struck here at home as well as in Europe. So there, and that had just been 10 years earlier, less than 10 years earlier. So I think that these men saw what happened if the breadwinner of a family died, leaving a woman with three, five, seven, nine children to support at a time when women weren't expected to go out and work and the very, very limited job opportunities. So that's the only thing I could come up with that made sense to me. But these are the two choices that she has, and that's what the book about. It is about her brother-in-law's putting pressure on her, telling her that her husband would be turning over in his grave if she sends her children off to his children and hers, of course, off to an orphanage versus letting them live with family who may just put them in the field. So she had two unlovely uh, decisions. And the orphanage, by the way, is several hundred miles away in Western North Carolina. So it's not, she sent her children there, she would rarely be able to see them. So that's what the book is about. Well, in your book blurb, you talk about how the book is written with humor and how explain that. Well, I think there are actually a lot of opportunities to laugh throughout this book. You wouldn't think so from the the main arc of the story, but I depict what family life must have been like. After all, I knew my grandmother and I knew my aunts and uncles and my own mother. My mother was her daughter. And I I'm very sure it wasn't all doom and gloom as they sat around. So I have various family members uh, coming to visit. They tell stories. Some are, oh gosh, you know, handy little tips. How to, for young girls, how to find out who you're going to marry. And these were actually little rituals that I was told by my grandmother and my, my great aunts and so forth. The kind of things that probably in the 1800s and centuries before that, young girls would do, you know, combing their hair at midnight, looking over their shoulder into a mirror. And if they saw the face of a man, that would be the, the, the image of the man they would marry. There was a story about um, two sisters who would um, prepare a meal for their future husbands at midnight, because these things always happen at midnight. And the girls would have to cook an entire meal together. So if they were flipping corn cakes or whatever, they had to hold a spatula together. Everything had to be done together. And at the stroke of midnight, the kitchen door would open and in would walk two men 
who would sit down and eat the meal without a word, and then they would stand up and leave, and therefore the girls would see who they were going to marry. They might not know which one was going to be theirs, but one of the two. The only caveat was they could not laugh the entire time they were making the meal. And Curtis, I'm sure you know how likely that was to happen with two girls. So, no. But there were just um, family stories, some of which, a number of which actually happened. So I got to use some of the stories that my grandmother had told me, as well as there may have been one or two that were actually my stories that I gave to some other character in the book. Um, so it is, I think... Uh, a hopeful book. I think there's a sweetness to it when you see the the love that the family members have for each other and uh, the grace that my grandmother showed during this incredibly difficult period when she's still a young woman. And I also try to to show that the importance of resilience. I think that's one of the main themes of this book is how important it is to be resilient and that you don't have to be a heroic character to show that quality or the quality of bravery, courage. Uh, the name of the book is A High Courage. And I think that the main reason I wanted to write this book was, first of all, to honor my grandmother. I think her story deserves to be told. I think she needs to be acknowledged. And I also wanted to model that for other people who are going through difficult times to to see how, you know, it may not be full of great moments. There are absolutely no car crashes in this book at all. But that, you know, through quiet resilience, uh, a really beautiful life can be made. Why do you feel that it's so important for us to talk to our older relatives? Because I do believe that my family is hardly the only one that has an amazing story. And I do think my grandmother's story is an amazing story. I think every family does. I wish I knew the stories from my great-grandmother. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out why I didn't ask more questions when I was growing up. I guess when you're young, you're sort of uh, self-absorbed. You know, you're more interested in your own life. But every family... Every single branch of every family has amazing things to tell. Think of all the, the things that our ancestors have gone through to get us here. You know, we are the ultimate result of all their trials and tribulations and their joys. Um, so it's not always all negative, but it has really reminded me that these stories are like in the air. We can't see them. And if we don't get them from the people who know them, soon they're going to be gone. I think I also didn't ask many questions because I always felt like, oh, I can do that anytime, you know? Well, now I can't. They're all gone. They are all gone. And so I couldn't turn to my mother and ask, how did you feel when this happened or that happened? And I just didn't you know, think about that. So I hope that anyone hearing this or reading my book will start asking questions and get it written down. You don't have to write a book. You don't have to write a novel, but get something that you can hand down, down to your family members. Somebody is going to care, maybe not everyone, but they will be enough and to keep these stories going. What? Tell us about some of your influences. Who who influences you to write? What, what authors do you kind of look up to or get your inspiration from? Oh, gosh, so many. As I said, I have read since I, well, I don't even before I started first grade, I'm sure. I really, I think one of the authors who early on when I was a teenager made me want to be a writer would be Daphne du Maurier, the author of Rebecca. I think that would be the book most people would know her by. And it's a wonderful psychological uh, analysis of big, creepy English house and the scary housekeeper. So it's just a rollicking good story. But I thought, how magical to be able to take something and create a world. I love that aspect. A friend of mine a number of years ago was taking some kind of leadership course, and everyone had to come up with their, their biography. 
a six-word biography. Imagine. Have you ever done anything like that, Curtis? Not in six words. Try. You must try it. It is so hard. It is so difficult. And I finally, when she told, I love challenges like that. So when she told me, this is actually one of my former MBA students who was telling me this, and I thought, oh, that's 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 really hard. So I thought and thought, my six-word biography autobiography is living as many lives as possible. And I do that mainly through reading. So living as many lives as possible. So for me, reading the works of others allows me into so many different lives, so many different worlds places and experiences, past times, future times that I'm never going to literally be able to experience. But it feels like I have lived that life as I live, you know, when I finish that book. So uh, I really can't point to a single author. Of course, Jane Austen. I mean, that that just goes without saying. I read her in high school uh, on my own and much to my delight, found out how funny she is. You know, I had thought it would be intimidating and impossible to read. And I was lucky enough to pick Pride and Prejudice. And from that famous first line on, I was completely sucked into the story of the Bennett family. To me, that is a kind of magic. Authors, fiction authors especially, are, are magicians. They create these worlds that we want to be in for hours, days. So tell us about any current or upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about. Uh, I am about halfway through my next book, which is going to be about narcissism, changing changing gears quite a bit. So I think that my background, my undergrad and, and master's are in psychology and my doctorate's in management, but I've done I always keep one foot in the psychology field. So I'm fascinated by narcissists, and I've, I've known a few. They can be very, very destructive people. Uh, not, uh, Of course, we see them in criminal shows. It's become, become almost a cliche now for the lead detective to say, well, clearly, as they're devising a profile, this is a narcissist. But not all narcissists are criminals. Some of them are your best friends or your husband or your wife or your brother or your mother or your father or, you know, the people around us. Maybe it's your boss at work. And if you don't know what a narcissist is, if this is something that you're really unfamiliar with, they can really mess you up because you don't quite understand. You don't get it. There, there's a, an old famous movie called Gaslight. Angela Lansbury, I think it was maybe her first movie. She plays a maid, but uh, made way back, maybe the 40s, an old, old movie. And Gaslight, and that's a term that has been borrowed in the narcissism field because one, things, one thing that narcissists do is uh, they gaslight people. They try to make them think that that the person's reality isn't real and the narcissist wants them to accept their reality of events. So they, they're very manipulative. They lack empathy. They really don't care about you at all, although they may act like they do. And there are different types of narcissists. So I have various characters in the book I'm working on who represent sort of different types of narcissists in a what I think is a very believable world. It starts in the ni- late 1960s and goes to probably middle 1980s. So not quite as far back as a high courage went, but it's still a little back in time. Well, throw out your websites so everybody can keep up with what you're up to and get your book. My website is very simple, gailpiner.com. And Piner is with one N, P-I-N-E-R. Gail is G-A-I-L-P-I-N-E-R.com. And if they'd like to 
send me an email. They could do that at Gail Piner Author altogether at gmail.com. Close us out with some final thoughts. Maybe if there was something I forgot to touch on that you would like to talk about it, just any final thoughts you have for the listeners. Again, I'd like to say that, you know, talk to your family and get those stories written down. You think you're going to remember them forever, but that may not happen. Even a simple notebook with it written out for your family. I have a few letters that my grandmother wrote and uh, to me, and they are amongst my most precious things. So you don't have to be a great writer. You don't even have to be grammatically correct, but get those things written down and give them to your family. And I hope you'll read A High Courage and enjoy my book. All right, ladies and gentlemen, gailpiner.com. Be sure to check it out, pick up her book. And like she said, talk to your relatives, your older relatives, and get as much information as you can so you can hand it down. I would also like you to follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. If you have any guests or suggestion topics, the Jackson 102 at Cox.net is the place to send them. As always, thank you for listening. And Gail, thank you so much for joining me today. Curtis, thank you so much. I enjoyed it. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream. dream.